Okay, so we are in Genesis 12, where we went over the, the Abrahamic covenant, which is going to be elaborated a little bit more throughout the book of Genesis. The, the main core we already got, but God will add elements and explain it a little bit further. He'll say things like, your descendants will be like sand on the seashore and like the stars of heaven, stuff like that that will, will fill out more of what... Um, what these ideas are, okay? One of the questions that's going to be on the, the post that you guys will work on on the Abrahamic Covenant is going to be what are, um, and it'll be really easy to see this, but what are the, the three elements, three main elements of the Abrahamic Covenant that God promises that will, to Abraham that will come through Abraham and his descendants? What are the three main things? Yeah, Hudson? Um, one, the seed of Eve, two, a nation of Israel, and two, blessings or curses. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so right. The, um, oh, and one more that we want, want to include um, in there, everything you said is true. Uh, we want to include land, which yeah, I think you're including the idea of nation as well. But um, yeah, so, so land, seed, and nation that's what he was talking about, and then blessing for all the families of the earth, but also the, the warning of curse that those who try to impede this plan or impair this plan in some way, God says, I will bless those who bless you, the one who curses you, I will curse. And the, the part of the, yeah, yeah, and part of the law, when God brings the law of Moses to kind of regulate and administrate this covenant says, for obedience to the law, there will be blessings. For, curse, uh, for disobedience to the law, there will be curses. The problem is sinners don't keep the law of God, and we know that uh, to be the case. Okay? And so that's why they need Christ to actually uh, undo the curse of the law, to keep the law, and then to bring about uh, blessing. But that will come about... Um, later as, as these ideas develop. So the, we've talked about Abrahamic covenant. First one talked about land. Okay. Now land is going to be the land of Canaan. It will be Israel. Um, the, these geographical borders that are going to be kind of the, the center point of where God is, is working from and what he's accomplishing. Okay. And this is going to be kind of like a replacement Eden. This is going to be another land. Now remember Adam and Eve, they sin, where do they get kicked out of? The garden. They get kicked out of the garden. Now Israel, they're going to have a land, they're going to enter the days of Joshua, but God, God warns them through Moses, if you keep breaking the law and bring on yourself the curses of the law, eventually you'll get kicked out of the land. And that happened um, to them as well. They got kicked out of the land, the temple was destroyed. Okay. And they kind of got brought back, and that's where the Old Testament ends, and uh, then the New Testament begins in the days of Jesus. But they have this land, okay? And so this land is going to be uh, fertile. It's going to be God's going to bless it. They're going to kind of have, a, uh, in a sense, a reversal of the curse, okay? And then the next part of the, the Abrahamic covenant is seed, right? Uh, seed... Where's the, the time that we hear about, and, and Hudson mentioned this as well, where's the time we hear about seed in earlier in Genesis? Yeah, Patrick? Uh, the seed will crush the serpent. The seed will crush the serpent, yeah. So now this, that promise is being picked up and plugged into this covenant, that that's Abraham and his family is how that promise uh, of the coming seed, the seed of the woman, it narrows down and says it's going to be through Abraham's family that that's going to take place. Narrows it down further, it'll say through Judah, through David, okay, and, and it goes on from there. But um, the seed promise that Abraham is going to have offspring, descendants, and that they are going to become a nation, okay? So that they're going to grow into a, not just a set of individuals, but into a nation that is supposed to be God's nation in the world to have an international impact. Okay, so I'm going to write that down again uh, for this idea of nation, uh, because it's important. International 
impact. That Israel, once God creates them as a nation and gives them his law and rescues them from Egypt and gives him them his covenant, he doesn't do this with any other nation, their goal is they're supposed to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Their example, their obedience to the law of God, God actually speaks to them, gives them his word and his commandments. They're, the nations are supposed to see the wisdom of God, the blessing of God, and come to God through, uh, through Israel. They're supposed to have an international impact. The problem is they don't keep the law, right? And we wouldn't either if we were, uh, we were there. So one of the big questions that Deuteronomy uh, ends with, as Moses preaches and he's about to die and not go into the land, before they go into the land, Moses says, you're going to fail and, keep, and break the law and you're going to get kicked out of the land. And instead of being a blessing to the nations, you're going to be stuck in the curse. And then, you know how Moses ends that sermon? He ends it in Deuteronomy 29 by saying, well, you know, people are like wondering, how's God going to do this? What are we going to do if that's going to be the case? And then Moses says, the secret things belong to the Lord. Right? People usually use that verse to talk about like, oh, well, you know, just God works in mysterious ways. Now, Moses is saying... There's not a solution unless God does it, and he tells us what, what happens. So, uh, but there is. He, he does bring that about in Christ. God has to eventually do it, uh, do it all through Christ. Um, but yeah, the, they're supposed to be a blessing to the nations, and, and the nations are to, and down to the families of the earth, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed, okay? So there's this hope for the restoration of uh, blessing, because the earth is, since Genesis 3, the earth is under what? Opposite of blessing in the Bible. Curse. curse. Yeah, that we're stuck under the default of curse, right? It was good, it was blessed in the day God made the world, but, and he blesses it, there's rest, there's enjoyment, there's, there's holiness, that God sanctifies the seventh day, all this stuff. That, but then curse comes in, and that's the default. Now we see Genesis 12 shifts over, and God says, there is a promise for how I'm going to restore this world through this covenant and, uh, and bring back this state of uh, blessing. We also saw that the Abrahamic covenant is huge for us. If you're, a, if you're a Christian, you're a true believer in Christ, and you're not a Jew, then this is a huge deal for us because this is part of the uh, scriptures and the logic that Paul and Peter and James will use to talk about how do we deal with that the Gentiles in the early church are coming to faith in Jesus? Don't they have to become Jewish first? Don't they have to get circumcised? Don't they have to fall under the, the law? And eventually Peter and James and Paul, Peter says in Acts 15, he goes, we were never able to keep the law of Moses, neither us nor our fathers, so we're not going to put it on to the Gentiles who are coming to God uh, through Christ in grace. And so this is a, a huge uh, deal that the, the nations uh, can be incorporated in this um, as well. And Paul will use um, verses from Genesis to prove his point about justification by faith and that God uh, credits this, uh, the sinner in Christ with Jesus' righteousness. So um, these, these chapters of Genesis are huge for the gospel huge for for the things that uh, that we not only the things that we believe but also for uh, for knowing about uh, what our salvation actually is so um, so the Abrahamic covenant is very impactful so let's look at, uh, at the, as uh, these chapters develop now we talked about last time Abram is how old when God approaches him, calls him, and gives him this promise. How old about? 75. 75, yeah. But he is 
does not have these promises fulfilled in the birth of Isaac until Genesis uh, 21. Okay, Genesis 21. Now that doesn't seem that far away, but Genesis 21, how old is Abraham when Isaac is born? 100. 100, yeah. So he has to wait for 25 years. Now what we see is Abraham does believe God. He does trust God in a saving way. But God is going to give him um, opportunities of, of testing that are going to show Abram that faith does not mean that I, I channel God, I manipulate God, I, I just have, I just believe really hard, you know, like Disney Channel always talks about like, believe in yourself, and if you believe hard enough, anything is possible type of thing, and uh, the best uh, time that Disney, and I don't think they, I don't know if they intended this or not, but Disney is all about believe in yourself, but you know when, um, have you guys seen Toy Story? You know when Buzz yeah. Lightyear thinks he's like, I'm just going to believe in myself, and then he tries to fly and then just falls on the ground. That's, that's what it, it's like. Because we think faith is like a, a work that we do, that I like really believe God hard, and then that will cause things to happen. No. Faith, biblically, is a surrender of that control, a recognition that God does it all, and that we contribute zero uh, percent and God has to do a hundred percent so Abraham believes God in a saving way but God is going to continue to test him to show no there is no other way except for God to uh, to do it all and that's going to take 25 years okay um, so in Genesis 12 there's a famine that takes place and Abram, remember he's been commanded, go forth, go into the land that I'm going to show you, live there, walk around there. This is the land I'm going to give to your descendants, your seed. Okay. But then there's a famine, and Abram leaves and goes to Egypt. And this is where he lies, he gets deceptive about Sarah not being his wife. He says he's, she's his sister, which she is his half-sister, a different... Uh, mothers of the same father, I believe, okay, so um, we'll, we won't get into that right now, but um, so he's not, I, you know, he's being deceptive, not technically an outright lie, but he doesn't, he's not forthcoming that uh, Sarah's his wife, okay, or Sarai at this, at this point, okay, now, there's a problem, it's not a big deal to like move somewhere, okay, but remember, God has told Abram, go into this land, and then there's a famine, test of Abraham's faith, and he leaves and goes to Egypt. Okay, And now, in a way, the seed promise gets threatened, because Pharaoh says, okay, oh, she's not your wife? Cool, well, you know, then I'll make her one of my wives. And now, that threatens potentially this. Okay, Now, remember, um, what does God say about the nations that curse or bless uh, Abram? Uh, what's going to happen to them? Yeah. They'll be cursed or blessed. They'll be cursed or blessed. Okay, so now, even though Pharaoh and the Egyptians don't know, this is what starts happening to them. He starts to, to take Sarai as his wife, and before anything happens, now there's famine, there's issues in Egypt, and they're like, what is going on? And Abraham finally fesses up and says, well, actually, she's my wife. But you start to see that now they're starting to experience curses because of Abraham's uh, disobedience and impeding the plan. But also, when Abraham is, is doing the right thing, and the nations are interacting with him in a positive way, they start to experience uh, blessing. Okay, so this is a pattern throughout Genesis. Now, Abram continues to grow, and in Genesis 13, he and his nephew, you guys know Abram's nephew? Lot, yeah. He, okay, so they continue to grow and expand. They have more people with them, more workers, employees, servants, uh, uh, livestock. So he's, he's building you know, wealth now. Abraham still does not have a son. Okay, so the promise has not been fulfilled there. Um, but they grow so much that he and Lot decide to kind of separate. They decide to kind of go their own directions just so they can continue to feed um, 
their flocks. Now the growth is fine. Now Lot decides to go uh, where? Do you guys remember? Where does Lot decide to go? And then the angels come and rescue Lot out of there later. Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah. He decides to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Now this will tell you something about Lot. Even though he's a righteous man, he chooses to go uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah where this, it already says their sin is, is great, but he thinks he can kind of um, avoid the influence of that. But look at Genesis uh, 13, 11, uh, 13, 10, and what it says about Sodom and Gomorrah. We see Abraham gets another kind of his test of his faith here because he doesn't, he does the right thing this time. He doesn't leave the land. Okay. But look at Genesis 13, 10. Said, now Abraham uh, tells Lot uh, that he says, look, you choose any direction you want to go, I'll just go the, another way and, and take the land over there. So you can have first pick. Genesis 13.10 says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah now is under the, the Dead Sea. It's all dead, the no salt, nothing grows there now. Okay. Um, now look at this detail. It says, like the garden of Yahweh, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is why it's a test for Abram. Lot looks around and he sees, okay, the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, he knows that area is known for, for its sin, okay, its rebellion against God, but Lot wants to select that area because it looks like what? There's a detail he adds there. Yeah, the garden of the Lord. looks like the garden of the Lord. Yeah, what's another name for that? That's in Genesis uh, two. Eden. Garden of Eden. Yeah. So now it looks like, okay, here's the garden of the Lord, and Lot says, "Hey, that looks good. I'm going to go over there." Sodom and Gomorrah. This time Abram does not. He stays. He stays in. Uh, the land, even though it looks like, hey, look, it looks like Eden's being accomplished over there outside of the plan of God, but Abram uh, actually believes this time. Okay, now, Genesis 14, a war takes place. There are three kingdoms and three kings that come and attack Sodom and Gomorrah, and who gets captured? You guys remember this? Who gets captured? Who just moved there? Lot. Yeah. So now there's this warfare going on between these kings and they fight down in this valley. And who goes to rescue Lot? Um, Abraham. Abraham. Yeah, his uncle. He gets together his small force of about 350 uh, men and actually is able to go and successfully fight a battle. But now we see this idea of Abraham is kind of entering the war with the kings like he's a king. And when he wins, it, it, Abram's not officially a king, but he's, he's kind of a, of the same status as them. And then this other king shows up, um, this kind of mysterious guy named Melchizedek. Okay? And he is called a priest of the Most High God, and he's called a king of Salem, which is ancient uh, Jerusalem. Okay. And he blesses Abraham, and Abraham gives him a tenth of the spoils from war and all this stuff, and he, he reaffirms these promises uh, to Abraham. Okay. Now, this why I mention this is now we're starting to see a, a theology develop of the idea of a king, king and uh, priest. Okay. Now, here's, here's the kind of tricky thing with this. The priestly system in Exodus that's of the family of the Levites, they're the ones who administrate the temple and, the stu and stuff like this later, they are not allowed to be kings. And kings who are of the line of Judah are not allowed to be Levitical priests. But, and, and when they try to do that, Saul tries to make a sacrifice, God punishes him for that. Um, Hezekiah tries to make a sacrifice, even though he's a good king. God punishes him for that, okay? But David recognizes, in Psalm 110, he says, look, I, I realize that God's moving things in this direction, that to really do my job as the king of Israel, I have to act like, in a good way, 
a priest. And he says, but not the priest like the Levitical system. I need to be a king priest like uh, Melchizedek, who is the king and the priest. Now, David says, that's not going to be able to be me. I can't really do that. So he, but he, so he looks ahead to the Messiah and says he will be uh, a king and a priest. Uh, Zechariah talks about this. Ezekiel, um, Isaiah talks about this. Um, you guys know Isaiah 53 where it talks about the suffering servant? Okay. It, the language there, and we'll get into this later, but the language there talks about him fulfilling the role of a priest. It talks about he'll uh, sprinkle many nations, sprinkled with the blood um, of the covenant. That's what the priests did. And he also offers himself as a sacrifice. That's what uh, Isaiah 53 is a priestly work. At, even though Isaiah 53, he is the, the king as well. Okay, um, and then Hebrews picks up on this and says that's, that's Jesus. That's his role as, uh, as the great high priest, okay? So this theology is developing here, okay? Now, Abram still has not had um, a child yet. So turn over to Genesis 15. Abram has still not had a child yet. Now, he believes, this is to Abram's credit, he believes God's promises are true, but he starts thinking of ways that he can kind of make God's promises happen. And kind of, you know, if, if you were told something by like your parents, they made you some like promise and you believed them, but it wasn't happening for a really long time. You may think, well, maybe what they were saying, I'm taking it kind of not exactly what they meant. Uh, maybe I'm not getting exactly what they meant. So Abram starts thinking about this as well. And he thinks, okay, I'm going to have a descendant. I'm going to have a son. But maybe it doesn't have to literally be from uh, my own body and Sarah's own body. And so what would be like a way you could, you could kind of go around... Uh, you would still have a son or a daughter, but you could kind of go around having it from your own body. Yeah. Adopt somebody. You could adopt somebody. Yeah. And then, so he says, look, okay. He says, I have an heir, uh, to someone who would receive his property if he died. And that's his servant, Eliezer, who was born, grew up with Abraham. Great, uh, guy, righteous man, but not Abraham's, uh, literal descendant. Look at Genesis 15, um, one. <clears throat> It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, uh, and let me just pause there and make a note here. Sometimes, you have to be careful with this, but sometimes like here in scripture, it, it talks about, we see like the word of the Lord, like scripture or sometimes the content of the words. Here it is much more personal. The word of the Lord is actually God showing up um, and talking to Abraham. Look, it says the word of Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision saying. So this word of the Lord says things. He speaks and acts as God. So when John, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, the word was God, right? This is um, an early indicator of that, that the word of God uh, comes in God's name, God's presence, speaks and acts as God himself. Okay, now he says, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you, your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? Uh, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given me no offspring, one born in my house is my heir. So he says, look, okay. God, I think I get what you're doing here. You haven't given me a son, even though you said that that was going to happen. So you must have meant that the, this Eliezer of Damascus, he's like a son to me. He's born in my house. He'll be my son. He'll be my heir. God says, no. Look at this detail that God uh, adds here as he elaborates. He says, then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one uh, who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Okay. So now we've added the detail of what? What's, what's the detail that God adds to Abraham? 
His son will be genetically related to him. Yeah, genetically related. He's going to come from Abraham's body, the normal um, marital relations that reproduce children. Okay, So now Abraham's had it clarified to him that God says it exactly how he means it. Um, now Abraham's going to try to get around this again, so is Sarai, because he, he could think, follow me on this one, okay, I know it's going to be from my own body, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be from what? Sarah's, Sarah's body. Yeah, and then it, they, Sarah uh, comes up with this idea and says, okay, you know what, if you take my maidservant, Hagar, and you reproduce with her and have a son, He'll technically be your son from your body. He'll be adopted and as your heir. And that, that would count. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's, that's wrong, but that's what uh, they try to come up with to try to make the promises of God true, right? Um, and it, it hints that this is wrong um, because it's, they're, they're being, you know, God's testing them. They try to do it their own way and God locks off every way until he finally uh, realizes only God, uh, it has to, to depend totally on God. But it says in Genesis 16, 2, that remember that um, Adam, when he sinned, Eve offers him the fruit, and it said Adam listened to the voice of his wife and took from the fruit and he ate. Okay? Genesis 16, 2 says, repeats that line basically, it says, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai and then takes uh, Hagar and has his son uh, Ishmael, who is not the chosen one, but God um, is merciful to her, merciful to Ishmael, is going to make a nation out of him as well. And God, in basically in person, the angel of the Lord shows up to Hagar after Sarah gets mad at her and kind of kicks her out and Hagar flees. Um, God shows up and says, I've seen what's happened. This is, you know, you're, you're going to have a future, you're going to, you know, your son is going to be a nation as well. Um, and Hagar calls God uh, the God who sees. Okay, so that's Genesis 16. So look back at Genesis 15. One of the most important verses in the Bible, um, this is a verse that Paul will, will use several times to, to prove uh, justification by faith. Um, look at Genesis 15, 6. It says, then he, this is Abraham, then he believed in Yahweh, and he, he God, reckoned it to him as righteousness. Okay, some really important words there. This is the, Abraham now trusts in a fuller way, and he believes what God said. This is the founding principle of faith. Abraham is the father of the nation. He's also the father of faith. We're starting to see this, this key value be worked out in Abraham, okay, that he believes God, and that God takes that belief, that surrender, that trust, and God gives Abraham the credit of being righteous. That word there is reckoned or to credit something. Now, this is a really big deal because Paul will spend Romans 4 basically um, explaining this word and elaborating this word. This is what differentiates Protestant uh, theology, Protestant theology from Catholic theology. And this is our big dividing line on the gospel. We have many you know, important points of difference um, on what the gospel is and how it saves someone from Roman Catholics. Okay? We, all, we both believe in Jesus. We both believe Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? But where we divide is on, on worship and the gospel. And here in Romans 4, Paul will use this word to say what I'm teaching about God declaring someone righteous is not new. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Okay? Because Paul's argument is not that God makes you and I righteous. That is true. God does change our nature. But our right standing with God is that God takes the righteousness of Jesus and gives us the credit of it. Does that make sense? And he takes our sin and gave Jesus the credit of our sin. 
Okay, this word is also um, different color here. This word is also here uh, called imputed. Okay, it's when you take something and you give it the the credit. Okay, this is called imputation. The the Catholic understanding of what happens in the gospel is they say, yes, Jesus saves us. He's our savior, we're saved by grace, we could not have done this by ourselves. But what they say is that they believe that God's righteousness in Christ is, is infused into the believer and that God makes you righteous and then he looks at you and says, yes, you have become righteous in my sight. But that's not what... Um, Moses, Paul, uh, are talking about. They're talking about that God uh, credits Jesus' righteousness uh, to us. So some uh, question, and this is kind of a, a trick question, but um, if you see a, a believer, somebody who's a true believer in Christ, are you a sinner or righteous before God? True believer in Christ, are you a sinner, guilty, or righteous before God? Yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. You, you and I are, are sinners before God. Anything that we bring is sin, but God views us or declares us to be righteous. That's what justifies me. Um, and so when God looks at us, if you're in Christ, what does he actually see? What is he choosing to... to uh, count or reckon, yeah. They were blameless. They were blameless, yeah. But because of who? Jesus. But because of the righteousness of Jesus, yeah. We get the credit for His righteousness, and Jesus takes the credit for our sin. In the negative way, David will use this same word uh, for credited here. Same Hebrew word when David sins, <laughs> Psalm thirty-two, two. He says, "God, forgive me," and he says. Do not hold this sin against me. Do not count this sin. Do not uh, hold this sin in my account. Okay? So he's saying, he's asking God to not count his sins against him and also uh, credit him with righteousness that does not belong to him. Okay? So that's what the gospel is that, that uh, God gives us uh, the credit of Jesus's. Uh, righteousness. So Paul elaborates on that, and he uses Genesis fifteen six and and all the words there to prove that it's just our faith that God credits us uh, with Jesus's righteousness. Right. So um, so from the very beginning of the Bible, this is a uh, a concept that is going to be elaborated, um, and it's a huge deal for what we believe. Not not just what we believe doctrinally. But if you're a Christian, this is, this is uh, where your salvation stands or falls, is, is on what, what Jesus actually did. And Paul will even use the, even the order of the chapters matters. Because, and the order of the Bible. Because Paul will say that our righteousness cannot come from keeping the law of Moses. Right? Um, it's good. It's God's word, but let me put it this way. Abraham, does he have the law of Moses? No. No. He, so he, but God credits him as righteous based on his faith, right? So he cannot keep the, so Moses, so Paul will say, look, Abraham was credited as righteousness. He didn't even have the law. So therefore, Gentiles who don't have the law can be credited as righteous based on their faith as well. Another important thing. Has Abraham been commanded by God to perform uh, circumcision yet? Not uh, yet. That comes in Genesis um, Genesis uh, 17. You don't get circumcision, which is the, the sign of the covenant that you belong to this family, uh, that, and also it's commanded by the law of Moses until Genesis 17. And so there's this question in the early church of for Gentiles who want to come through God, through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, do you have to be put under the law and be circumcised? 
And how do they answer that question? What do you guys think? No. They decide no in, Genesis, in uh, books like Galatians and Acts 15. The church gets together and has a council. And there, there are a bunch of um, Jews who are there. And they're saying the Gentiles are turning to God uh, through Christ and faith. And some of the debate is, well, they need to take circumcision and, and put themselves under the law of Moses and become Jewish first before they come to uh, before they come to God through Christ. But Moses, uh, but Paul will argue that was Abraham when he believed God and God said he was righteous. Was he circumcised or not circumcised? No. Not. So he says, look, the righteousness that's from faith does not depend on the law, doesn't depend on circumcision. It's on faith alone. So big deal for us because that means there's no barrier for us as Gentiles to become uh, Jews first before we, uh, we come to uh, Jesus and come to God through him. So... And even like these, these early chapters, even the way that God has ordered that they're put into the Bible um, matters. Okay. Um, time are we at? Okay, we got a few minutes here. So Genesis 17, God gives Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Okay. Genesis 18, God shows up to angels in human form. Okay. Okay. God shows up um, and makes the promise again. He makes the promise uh, that Isaac will be born in one more year, or that his Abraham's son will be born in one more year. Sarah overhears this, and how does she react in overhearing this? You guys remember? Okay. She starts laughing. She laughs, yeah. That Sarah, um, or still Sarai at this point, overhears and laughs, and then God, the angels kind of confront her, they're like, why did you laugh when I said that? And she's like, I didn't laugh, you know, felt, you know, she was scared. And, and so she laughs about it, but remember Isaac's, do uh, you guys know what Isaac's name means? Does that mean laughter? It means laughter, yeah. Aww. So he's, he's named <laughs> laughter because it's kind of like she, you know, it's unbelievable. And in a sense, it was. I mean, it wasn't something that they were going to produce on, uh, on their own. God has locked off every other way that they could uh, try to figure this out themselves. Okay? Um, that's why he's growing um, their faith. Okay? Um, now, Genesis 19, God announces, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19 is, uh, is the, the destruction of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But the angels go to rescue who? Who's there that's important to Abraham? Lot. Yeah. And it's kind of gross. Um, uh, and I'm not just referring to the, the sexual promiscuity and the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's true. However, Lot, afterward, he, he's very, even though he's a righteous man, the scripture describes him as that, he gets drunk and has a, an incestuous relationship with his daughters. And they produce children. And, and these children become um, the, the Moabites and these, and, the, and I'm trying to remember the other nation that comes out of them. Uh, um, Hittites. Hittites, yeah. And so this is going to be a, uh, these will be enemies that will later fill um, the land. Okay, so, doesn't, you know, that's the last we hear about Lot. Lot's wife turns back, is turned into a pillar of salt. The whole area is destroyed with, uh, with sulfur from heaven and turned into um, a salt uh, land. The, the Dead Sea is, is where this location is now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Genesis 20. Um, Abraham lies about Sarah being his sister again. Similar situation happens. Um, and then. 21, okay, let's skip ahead to 21 here. 21, what happens in 21? Isaac is born. Okay, so now the promise that God has made is fulfilled. 
Isaac starts growing up after some years. Now, now the, the plan of God can move forward. Abraham's faith is being brought to maturity, um, but there is going to be a uh, kind of a final test for Abraham in, in bringing his faith to complete maturity. Genesis 21 is next door. The next chapter is Genesis 22. Okay, I know that's, you guys already know that, but what is the big event of Genesis 22? It's a narrative you guys know. Yeah. Sacrifice of Isaac. Sacrifice of Isaac. Yeah, so now after 25 years of waiting, Isaac is finally born. The next event in the narrative, some years take place between, but the next event in the narrative, God says, after years of waiting for this promise, for this son, doing it their own way and God rejecting that, saying, no, I'm going to do it my way, you need to trust me. God now says, kill him. Or, Sacrifice your son. And he, he, he elaborates and says, your, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. He doesn't just, you know, he, he lays on the, the details here and says, sacrifice, uh, hang on a sec. Um, now this doesn't seem to be consistent with God's nature and character, and it also doesn't seem to be consistent with God's plan and promise. So Abraham is now going to face the ultimate uh, test. We'll come back to that uh, next time. Yeah, Patrick, you had a question or comment? So in 21, 8 through like... Uh 14 or whatever, it like talks about Hagar and Ishmael again. So does mm -hmm. this take place after God's promise or before God's promise? Um, well, I mean, the promise is made in Genesis 12. Do you mean after Isaac is born? Yeah, because it's yes. it, like talks about them again. Yeah, um, it's where they kind of get, they separate them out. Uh, after Isaac is born, there's some kind of, there's kind of conflict and Sarah kind of doesn't want like a competing family and a competing son around, um, even though she was the one that kind of facilitated that. And so God tells them to kind of, yeah, go your separate ways. And so All right. that's what takes place there. Yeah, good question. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, so how old, um, or how old I'm not sure. Um, he's obviously old enough to recognize what's going on because he, he talks with Abraham. You can see in Genesis 22, if you read ahead, his conversation uh, with, with Abraham. Isn't he like early teens? Yeah, yeah so, teens. so probably your guy's age. Who knows? So, like, in, so, you know, he, uh, he old enough to know what's going on, right? Not, to talk, to recognize, he says, Dad, where's the... Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Uh, and, and Abraham says, the Lord will provide a ram for the sacrifice. <laughs> Isaac, it would be an act of faith for him as well. Um, so anyway, we've got to end it there. It's 939, but good questions, guys.